thank you everyone for being here tonight for our panel. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about the COVID-19 vaccine and we have some wonderful guests with us to discuss and answer questions regarding uh, the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, so I'm going to introduce each of them and then we are going to just kind of take off and start answering some questions. So first um, I'm going to introduce Mary Frances Sears. She is our physician assistant at Lenore Ryan and has been a part of our campus for just over two years serving um, in our student health clinic. Before coming to Lenore Ryan, she spent 15 years in family medicine and Mary Fran graduated from Meredith College and then went on to ECU where she earned her master's degree in physician assistant studies. Mary Fran loves working at LR and she has been a valuable asset to us in the Cornerstone House and brings her passion to help our students um, be the best that they can be through good physical, mental, and emotional health. And we're very fortunate to have her here tonight. Next uh, to Mary Fran's left is Jennifer McCracken and she is currently serving in the role of health director for Catawba County Public Health and took this role shortly before the COVID-19 pandemic began. So um, I guess it's initiation by fire. Um, she has been able to show visionary leadership as the health department began partnering with our long-term care facilities, childcare facilities, schools, and organizations that work with vulnerable populations, conducting case investigations and contact tracing rolling out low barrier testing, and now vaccinating thousands of people throughout the county and beyond. Ms. McCracken holds a Master's of Public Administration from Appalachian State University, a Certificate in Public Leadership from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her background includes clinical experience and case management, as well as supervision of essential programs that directly benefit families in Catawba County. And we are very fortunate to have her here with us tonight. Next is one of our own LR Bears, Olivia Thorne. And Olivia is a junior at Lenore Ryan um, and is majoring in biology with a chemistry minor. She is currently serving as our SGA student body president is also president of the Lineberger Fellows Program, vice president of community service, and training for the Broyhill Institute for Leadership. Olivia also works as an EMT at the Matthews Fire Department and has been administering the COVID vaccine since January at Bojangles Coliseum in Charlotte. And she additionally has received both of the Pfizer doses. In her free time, she enjoys hiking, camping, and playing various sports um, outdoors, such as basketball or sand volleyball, and also loves going to small concerts of up and coming artists. And then last but not least, we are very fortunate to have Mike Long with us, who is a pharmacist, um, and will be able to give us his perspective. And Mike is a graduate of the University of North Carolina Eshelman School of Pharmacy at Chapel Hill. He completed his pharmacy residency requirement at Duke University School of Medicine and has served the Hickory community as a pharmacist since 1981. He has been a member of the pharmaceutical staff at Fry Regional Medical Center and Cornwell Drug and has been on staff at Medical Center Pharmacy since 1996. And we are very pleased to have him here joining us as well. So we will go ahead and just start with some questions. Um, we're going to kind of hopefully keep this as a conversational style, letting folks jump in um, and continue on uh, as they see fit to answer the questions. So we've got a list of questions tonight for our panelists. Um, and so first, I guess, um, we'll start with, can you all tell us a little bit about the different COVID vaccines that are out there? Um, and how or if they are different from other vaccines. <laughs> okay. Can you hear, hear me mm -hmm. pretty well? Okay. Um, so yeah, we have all talked about this. We're just gonna jump in with, um, with what our area of expertise is. Um, so as of right now, um, what has been approved um, for vaccination is um, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, the Moderna vaccine, and then the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, 
how these vaccines are different from other vaccines, um, grouping them together, um, Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine are um, using messenger RNA, um, which is technology that's been around for about 15 years. Um, they have used vaccines um, like messenger RNA to treat, um, to use against Ebola, or Ebola, I should say, um, the Zika virus, um, I think SARS and MERS, they were looking at um, that technology as well. Um, and then the Moderna, tech, Moderna vaccine, they have that same technology with the mRNA. Um, the Johnson & Johnson uses more of a, um, a virus, a vector, which I'm gonna let um, Bill talk more about that one. <laughs> but um, I think as far as how these vaccines differ from just your standard ordinary vaccine, um, Bill is, can definitely expand on this, I'm sure, but um, in the past, I think they've used more either weakened versions of the virus or they've maybe used a little portion of the virus that they have um, then injected and then had that stimulate your immune system to fight against that particular virus or bacteria. Um, with the mRNA vaccines, um, they're using something that our body already has. I think that's a comfort to know that, you know, we're full of, we're made of cells, tissues, organs, and with each cell, you've got DNA, RNA, which then gets broken down to mRNA, tRNA, all this different stuff. So they're using vaccines that have um, mRNA that um, tells, that gives your body, gives your body instructions on how to make this special protein that is, um, unique to the COVID-19 virus. And with that protein, your body sees that as foreign and then that's how it stimulates the immune system to develop antibodies against it. Um, Bill, can you help with the vector? The vector, they contain a weakened version of a live virus, a different Bill. virus than the one that causes COVID. Thank you. <laughs> um, the vector vaccines contain a weakened version of a live virus but it's a different virus than the one that causes COVID-19. That has genetic material from the virus that causes it, um, inserted in it. And once the viral vector is inside our cells, the genetic material gives cells instructions on how to make a protein that is unique to the virus that causes COVID-19. And using those instructions, our cells can make copies of the protein, which will then prompt your T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, that will remember how to fight the, um, the virus in the future. Uh, does anybody need refreshing on activation? <laughs> 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 I can do a quick rundown. Um, B lymphocytes are uh, defensive white blood cells. Uh, they produce antibodies that attack the pieces of the virus left behind by the macrophages. T lymphocytes are another type of defensive white blood cells, and they attack in the body where it's already been infected. The macrophages are white blood cells that swallow up and digest the germs in dead or dying cells. The macrophages leave behind parts of the invading germs called antigens. The body identifies antigens as dangerous and stimulates the antibodies to attack them. And also, the body has what we call memory cells to protect a person um, getting the virus in the future. One thing I think that's also important to note is how it's similar in like to other vaccines. Mm -hmm. So the COVID vaccines still have the same exact purpose as any other vaccine, like the flu vaccine, for instance. And the only difference is the mechanism of action. So how the vaccine is really going to work in our body, but no matter which one you get, it has the same effect and protecting you from getting COVID and from spreading that to other people as well. And I know one thing that we try to tell our patients is that no COVID-19 virus is in the vaccine. There's no live virus in that vaccine. So I know we'll get into symptoms later, but if people do start feeling, um, you know, any type of reaction after they receive the vaccine, it's not because there's a live virus. It's just their body responding to and making antibodies, uh, you know, that's gonna attack that, that, that virus later if they come in contact with it. Great. I think one more other thing, Jenny, yeah. I was gonna add that 
um, I feel like is a comfort to people is to myself too is you know science is amazing I, um, I I read up I read through these things and I just think our body is amazing that it can break down to all these levels but I feel like it's important to know that everything um, that is given through vaccines or medicine these are all things that we already have in our body as it is and these are natural process these are processes that are being created that are already going on in our body that we don't even recognize so I feel like that's important just to remember that this is science there's a lot of research and evidence behind it these are things that are already going on in our body they're just creating it to mimic um, to mimic a situation to where our immune system will go ahead and respond so I feel like that provides comfort to, mm -hmm. to this so in talking a little bit further about the vaccines can you all talk more specifically about the differences between the Moderma, the Pfizer, and now the newest Johnson & Johnson. Are there a lot of differences? Are there not a lot of differences? And what might somebody look for in making a decision? I don't really see, if it were, uh, I would get the, the first one that's available to me. Um, as far as age groups, I believe that um, you need to be um, 18 years old or 16 years old. Um, the Moderna and the Pfizer are two shots, whereas the J&J &J is one shot. Um, and that is good. The one shot is good if you have trouble coming back. There was a study that said you could possibly wait as much as 42 days, but that's pushing it. Um, so if I had to pick, you know, and you had trouble getting back to a site or a doctor or something, J&J &J could be the way to go. All of them reach the, the goal was set at 50%, and all of them are way above that. And when people say that J&J &J is only 70-something and Pfizer is 90-something, you've got to realize when J&J &J did their test, some of the variants could be out there. It was at a different time, a different location. So when it all comes down to it, they're probably all very equal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and right now, you know, vaccine availability is still an issue, whether it's in Catawba County, across North Carolina, across the country, et cetera. So when, when one does have the ability to get a vaccine, like Mike said, we highly recommend that they get a vaccine, no matter if it's Moderna, Pfizer, or, or the Johnson & Johnson product. It's just important to go ahead and take advantage of that opportunity. I think on the cellular level, they're, they all three do the same thing. They all three are making this protein that your body's identifying as foreign that's specific to COVID-19 virus. Um, so I feel like on that level, they're all the same. Um, I feel like the mechanism of action is not a, anything to, to you know, stand back about. Um, so I feel like y'all are right. Just availability, if you can get it, that's what you need to get. All right, great, thank you. So in talking about the vaccine, what are your all's thoughts about why people should go ahead and get the COVID-19 vaccine, one of the, sh one of the three that are available? So I, I think really it's twofold. I think that one should get it for, um, really for your own health as well as for the health of others. Um, you know, we know that COVID-19, um, folks who have COVID-19, they can have different types of reactions. They can have a very mild case where they maybe feel bad for a couple days and start to feel better after that. They can be asymptomatic or they can be very ill and hospitalized or, or even die. And so you just don't know how a person is gonna react to the virus. And so by taking the vaccine and just and taking that move to protect your own health, um, I think is really important. Um, you know, the other piece is really protecting the health of others. Um, you know, a lot of us are right now sitting up here, I think we're, we're healthy and, and those kinds of things, but we go home to people who may be immunocompromised. We may work with people who are immunocompromised or who have underlying health conditions. And so just because we care about those around us, we don't want um, a virus that, you know, that we would s spread to another person who, who's not as healthy as we are to cause hospitalizations or, or even further complications. Um, so if we can do the right thing by taking the vaccine protecting us, it also protects those around us. I completely agree. I know a lot of myself and my peers here at LR and 
just at home, we might not necessarily have a bad reaction to getting COVID because we are young and healthy, but we go home to our families or we go to work and interact with many other people or we go hang out with our friends and they go home to their families. So I know a lot of my peers are more concerned about their relatives, their parents, their grandparents and spreading it to them. So getting the vaccine not only can protect ourselves, but also protect those around us. And also it'll get us back to normalcy. Like I know every single student at LR wants to go back to having football games that we can tailgate for and mm -hmm. clubs that we can meet in person, not on Zoom and have in-person classes all the time. And the only way that we're gonna get to that is by getting everyone vaccinated and helping COVID stop so that we can do that. Just one extra thing. Another reason you should get vaccinated is, is to create herd immunity, which is 75 to 80% of people. Also, the more people that are vaccinated during that herd immunity, you're not gonna get the variant. The, the, the vaccine won't change because of so many people vaccinated. So that's Okay, that's great. I didn't have no idea about that with regard to the variant. So that's really interesting to know. Um, so how do I know whether or not the vaccine is safe? I hear this a lot from people like, is it safe? Because, you know, it's, it's so fast and so soon. And so um, what, what do you all think and how do you all um, speak to the safety of the COVID-19 vaccine? The vaccine, it was developed quickly but it was given the very highest priority. You know, all of the resources were put to developing the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and like we've talked about, it was already built on kind of years of technology related to vaccines. So really the concept, the process wasn't new. Um, obviously, we're j just looking at a new virus. Um, but lastly, you know, the other thing is, you know, the FDA and, and manufacturers, there's a lot of red tape, a lot of hurdles that, that you have to go through in getting and getting any type of a medication through those clinical trials. And all of, all of those barriers were removed. They basically allowed the COVID-19 vaccine to kind of jump the line, if you will, to, to other vaccines being developed and those sorts of things to get it to the point of, of, of being able to be used and, and tested. So, you know, it wasn't that, that, you know, it wasn't that corners were cut by any means. It was just all of the resources possible were put towards getting that vaccine out into the community. Well, some of the um, tests, when in the normal non-pandemic situations, you would run this, then you run that, then you run this. Whereas during this, they were done simultaneously, so you cut the time down. And so you think it's rushed, but it's not rushed. It was just a lot was happening at the same time as mm -hmm. opposed to one after another. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a good point. I feel like in a pandemic, that's kind of, that's probably the vaccine perfect timing because you really can test its effectiveness in a quick time. Okay. So with regard to North Carolina specifically, um, how is our state doing with regard to following CDC recommendations for the vaccine and priorities um, in our community? Yeah, so North Carolina has definitely been in line with the, with the CDC and, and the federal government in terms of prioritization. And so really from, from North Carolina's priority perspective, which follows right in line with the federal government, um, it really looks at protecting healthcare workers. So they were group one. Um, and those folks who are at highest risk of becoming infected, being hospitalized or dying. So if you think about group two, that was you know those who were 65 and older um, now we're moving into group three. So, um, so North Carolina really um, stayed the course in, 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 in matching their response to the federal government, which I very much appreciate and, um, and think that it served us well so far. And with that protocol, um, and I know the governor is talking on a regular basis and kind of keeping our state updated, um, where are we right now as far as who currently is the newest group that can get the vaccine as well as with our population here at LR 18 to 22 year olds um, when is that going to be um, available to them um, sooner than later <laughs> so right now we are in group three we are still serving folks who are in group one and group two but we're also entered into group three which is essential workers um, 
And as of March 24th, so not, not far down the road, we will be able to start vaccinating um, students. Um, so that's really exciting. So those who live in, uh, in congregate housing, those who might live in sorority houses or fraternity houses, for instance, um, and they will become eligible for vaccine. I do know that some students have already received the vaccine. Um, if you work in some type of a, a healthcare clinical program, I know we vaccinated nursing students and occupational health students. Um, if, you, if, you do, um, if you do have a job where, where it would um, really lend itself to, get, to, to already be in, in that group one, two, or three category, you may have already received the vaccine, um, or if you're 65 and older. So I think there is a, a, some portion of students who have been vaccinated probably so far, just like you have. Um, and so this will open up the opportunity for others. And I know as, uh, or speaking on behalf of public health, we look forward to our continuing relationship with Lenore Ryan University and how we can work together with Mary Fran um, and others to get students vaccinated. It's very exciting. It is very, very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> So once a person becomes eligible, what is the process to go and get vaccinated? How do they sign up? Where do they go? What does that look like? So right now we have a portal. It's called catabavaccine.org. And, um, and we've got kind of two tracks. So we've got the business track. So if somebody um, is, is a business owner, um, that they can sign up their business under that portal. And then we have the individual portal. Um, but I am, I, I figure, I, I, we've got to talk more with Lenore Ryan, but certainly um, like we've worked with faculty, um, you know, we hope to have some type of a process set forth where um, not every student's going to have to go and access through that portal that we can work with leadership in order to, to get folks signed up and kind of bulk uploaded into the mm -hmm. system and make it super simple for them. Um, because. I know um, students have a lot going on and there's a lot of deadlines and, dem and, and demands that they're trying to reach. So we want to make that process as seamless and as simple as possible. Okay. So more to come. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of going back to the vaccine itself um, and asking some more specific questions about that. Are there any potential side effects that a person would need to look for if they make that decision to get vaccinated? as well as are there any long-term concerns um, currently post-vaccine? I think as far as, um, so common side effects that one might have following a vaccine um, would be arm soreness, um, maybe a little bit of redness there, even a little bit of swelling, um, fatigue, uh, body aches, fever, um, low-grade fever, if you have a fever, um, or headache, and those are pretty common for pretty much any vaccine that, that one would get. Um, if they do happen, it would happen within 24 hours, and I, I know from what I've heard from people and what I just know just being in the field that, I, that I'm in, that the symptoms, if you do have side effects to a vaccine, they come, and then as quick as they came, they leave. So within, I would say, after that 24 hour mark, you'd be pretty, pretty good to go. Um, as far as like side effects, I, I usually tell people um, ibuprofen or Tylenol is something that you might be able to, to use to help comfort um, any body aches or headache. And then just using like a, com a cold compress on your arm would be good. I can speak to my personal experience. When I got the first dose, I just had arm soreness the next day. And let 24 hours the next day, my arm was fine. Just if I got any vaccine, like if I got the flu shot. And then after the second dose, I did about like six hours after receiving the dose, I had a headache and that lasted until the next morning and I just took some ibuprofen. But other than that, I felt completely fine and was back to normal the next day. Just let me reiterate, if this scares you, do not take your Tylenol ibuprofen before the shot. Wait till after the shot and when you can't stand it any longer, then you can take it, but don't pre-medicate. So, are there any uh, studies going on to look at, because I hear a lot of students asking about like long-term side effects, things they need to be worried about or concerned. Um, is there any truth to that? Is this kind of fictional um, and just been kind of sensationalized? And um, where do you all kind of stand on that? 
I don't know about you guys, but I have not, I tried hard to find long-term side effects from the COVID vaccines and I haven't found anything yet, um, which is encouraging. Um, I feel like the powers that be are going to be very, you know, they, they want this to work, but they also want people's feedback. So they, everybody who gets vaccinated um, is entered into this monitoring system to where, you know, if you have any type of reaction um, to the vaccine, then please report them. We need, we want to know that. They want to know that so they can look further into that. But I haven't found anything yet to suggest long-term side effects. Yeah, I haven't either. And I know when they were doing clinical trials, you know, thousands of people were involved in those clinical trials. And we had many people from our community. I know I've talked to several physicians who were involved in those. And um, I've heard nothing even c come out of those trials. And, you know, obviously they were the ones to receive the vaccine first. Thank you. So if a person has already had COVID, do they need to get vaccinated? <laughs> that is true. Um, if you've already had it, you still need to get the vaccine. You need to wait at least 14 days or when the symptoms are gone, you know, even maybe a little bit longer a month. But yes, you do need to, to get it. I feel, I feel like the reasoning I found on that was, and it makes sense, you know, when they vaccinate folks, they are studying them. They know um, so that they know what to expect. They know what the immunity is going to be from a vaccine versus when you're someone who's had, you know, COVID infection, um, the immune response, they're not quite certain because they don't, they haven't followed that. So I think it's just that added security and certainty that with the vaccine, that with the COVID vaccine, you've got that immunity that we know you have. Also the level of infection with COVID varies. Mm -hmm. Like there's asymptomatic people, there's people that have very severe responses to COVID and people that have just mild response like it's a cold. And so since being infected and having COVID isn't the same across the board, it's hard for them to know exactly how that will reflect with antibodies, but they know exactly how the vaccine reflects with antibodies and how long those will last and they can give that scientific data that supports that. So it's a much more sure response if you get the vaccine. So if I go and I get the vaccine, then do I still have to wear my mask and do I have to socially distance? Because this is one of the things um, I know our students in particular, they're ready to spend time with one another um, and have that companionship and that engagement. So what can that look like post vaccine? So the CDC just announced this week so some guidance about about folks who, who receive the vaccine and, and, and wearing masks. And so I think the first good, I think the first piece of good news is that you can gather indoors with fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask. Um, so that's exciting. I think about, um, haven't seen my parents since February um, of 2000, yeah, or February of 2020. So um, the fact now that we are all vaccinated um, and we can gather together is very exciting to me. So I, th I think that's one. I think that's one reason that we should all celebrate and all get vaccinated because we can spend time with people that we love and mm -hmm. our friends, etc. Um, you can gather indoors with unvaccinated people from one other household. So, for example, if you're visiting relatives and um, and you've had the vaccine, but maybe they haven't. You can, st you can gather indoors um, and be with them without mask unless any of them have an increased risk for severe illness. Um, so, so that kind of loosens up just a little bit. Um, they still are a little bit um, cautious about folks who live in group settings. So I think about students who live in dorms um, and have that super close contact with each other. Um, you know, they still say that if someone has been around somebody with COVID-19, if I say I'm vaccinated, but I've been around somebody with COVID-19 in a dorm or congregate living type of situation, that I would still need to stay away from others for 14 days just to go ahead and kind of quarantine myself um, just because that, that contact has been so close. Um, so those are some of the new guidelines that have come out this week. And of course, as we learn more about the vaccine, as they do more studies, I think that we'll see even more information come out from the CDC. I think it's encouraging that 
that came out this week because we just have started to roll out the vaccine and open it to further groups continuously. And as more people get vaccine, as more students get the vaccine, then I'm guessing that those protocols will become greater and it'll be like, okay, now you can interact with people outside without a mask on once everyone's vaccinated. So the more people that get vaccinated, the sooner those guidelines will be expanded upon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think everyone up here on the stage has received either both or at least one of the doses of the vaccine. Um, and I think it's, you know, important to share w what that experience was like, but also what it was that made you ultimately make that decision. I know for me personally, I've had one dose, um, but I recently had my parents move here from Florida <laughs> this summer, and I really enjoy hanging out with them and spending time with them um, and being able to see them because they have both been vaccinated. One's halfway there, one's fully vaccinated and, and my in-laws are also fully vaccinated. Being able to see that they were okay, but also knowing that I can spend more time with them was really a big motivator, but also working here at LR, I miss being face to face with my students all of the time. So for me, it was really about people um, and being able to continue to connect. Um, so can y'all talk a little bit about what your experience was like getting the vaccine, um, both of the, those doses, as well as what your motivation was for doing that? And I think some of you have already touched on that, but just kind of a little further. Want me to go first? Um, my motivation um, to get the vaccine was several different reasons. I, you know, I wanted to be able to see my parents. Um, so that was a big push to get vaccinated. Um, working where you can't see your patients <laughs> is, a, is not, um, it's not ideal. So that was, a, that was actually a big concern of mine over fall um, is I was concerned that I was gonna spread it to patients not knowing, or maybe I would get it from a patient and then take it back to my house. You know, so that whole, that whole part of it as far as my work part goes. Um, I'm a very social person. I love people. I love to be with people. I love to hug people. <laughs> so the fact that, you know, pretty much that has, this past year has been wiped out with all that, that was another big motiva motivator. I just, I wanted, I wanted to be able to get vaccinated so I could go out, I could listen to music outside, I could, you know, hang out with my friends, eat chi chips and salsa. I mean, <laughs> just all that good stuff that I love. So. Um, I will, I feel like I got my first vaccine and I feel like, a, you know, a hundred pound weight was taken off my back. I was like, oh, I can live a little bit more. <laughs> but, um, but seriously, um, those are my motivators for um, getting vaccinated. Um, myself being a Catawba Valley Medical Center employee, I um, was vaccinated at the hospital. The process was very smooth. Um, I was vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, that. They, I, had, I, you know, I sat after the vaccine for 15 minutes to make sure I wasn't um, having any type of side effects. Um, the, ne the next day I had a little bit of arm soreness, um, maybe a little bit kind of not feeling great. Um, but then by that Sunday, I felt completely fine. Um, the second vaccine, I had prepared myself um, to feel awful all weekend because that's what I had heard. Um, but I actually, felt hyper instead, which I've heard other people have that same response. So that second vaccine, I got it on that Friday, felt fine throughout the day. Then, and then on that Saturday, I felt like I had, had a great amount of energy abnormally <laughs> and um, maybe felt that way a little bit on Sunday. And then by Monday, I was back at work feeling normal. So <laughs> it was good. Um, gosh, there were a lot of reasons why I wanted to get the vaccine. I think the first is, you know, to lead by example. Um, you know, public health, we're, we're the responding organization for, for this pandemic and, um, and, and just to be able to lead, um, lead by example in getting the vaccine. So that was really important to me. Um, but, you know, vaccines are a cornerstone of public health and, and I, I believe in them, I always have. And um, so certainly, you know, it's just, it's just part of my DNA <laughs> is just to get those vaccines. Um, but then also, it really just for my family, you know, I've got um, a husband, I've got two kids that are involved in sports, and, 
and you know their school age and and just trying to do my part so we can get back to normal so my mm-hmm. kids can can get back to somewhat of a normal um, life and do the things that they enjoy doing and and you know my family they live out of town and just be able to to be vaccinated so I can visit with them and spend time with them um, you know it was just really important to me so um, so those were my reasons um, you know I was vaccinated pretty early on um, we began public health began vaccinating health care providers on December 27th and so leading up to that, of course, that was like the like right after Christmas. So, you know, the week of Christmas, we are gearing up, you know, to get everything ready. And so we wanted to have our staff who were working in those clinics um, already in the vaccination process since they were getting ready to, you know, expose themselves to, to the masses um, to vaccinate them. And so I received my first dose of Pfizer right before Christmas. And as soon as I received it, I was like, oh my goodness, like this is right before Christmas. I hope I'm okay to celebrate with my family. And, um, and I was fine. I had some arm soreness, just like Mary Fran talked about the day after. Um, and, you know, I, I, I felt fine. So when I got my second dose, um, like Mary Fran, I kind of expected the worst. Um, however, um, I woke up the next morning, my arm was sore, um, it was noticeably sore, but I could still function fine, um, and my joints ached a little bit, which is typically not normal for me, and, um, but I took some ibuprofen, like, like we were talking about, and went on my merry way, and I was just fine, I took my second dose on a Wednesday, never missed a day of work, um, and just, and just carried on, so, um, you know, I had a great experience, and and I would highly recommend it to others. Um, People's reactions are going to be a little bit different, but I think as long as you know what to expect going into it, um, and know what to, and and can plan for it, it it makes a difference. Definitely. So, my motivating factors were similar to yours. Um, My main reason was I was working as an EMT uh, back in Charlotte, and one of my biggest fears was that I would be having contact with all these patients that I'm seeing on a daily basis, and then I would bring whatever I got from them back home to my family, to my parents and my siblings that are at home. And I really didn't want to be the person that brought COVID to my home and spread it to other people, even if it wouldn't affect me as poorly. So I got my first dose back in January, so I was back home in Charlotte, and I got it at Bojangles Coliseum, which is where I'm administering the COVID vaccines currently. Um, The process was very smooth. I was in and out, sat for my 15 minutes, and went on with my day. And like I said before, my first dose, I just had a sore arm the next day. Um, And then when I got my second dose, I had a headache the next day. But other than that, I felt completely fine Um, and just relieved that I was vaccinated and we could all hopefully get back to normal even quicker. So I believe you've covered it all, basically. (laughs) I work in healthcare, so I didn't want to get it. I didn't want to give it. Didn't want to bring it home. Um, I have a, a 94-year-old father. Would love to see him more. Don't want to give it to him or grandchildren or my children. My first dose was in the January, and um, all I had was a sore arm, and it really was never sore until you got above this height. Um, second dose, I said, "Oh, here it comes. It's, it's going to be and nothing any different. Sore arm." That was it. I highly recommend it. But just as a little caveat, in the works right now, they're studying a nasal spray for COVID. And basically says no needles. And it basically blocks from even getting in your body pretty much there. And that, that is, if that technology comes about, that is going to be a tremendous game changer. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So. I guess just in closing, I would love to know from each of you one thing um, that you would like for our students or the community of Hickory and Catawba County um, to kind of take away from this evening. What's one thing you would just like for everyone to remember? I'm kind of putting everybody on the spot because I didn't ask this one. I would like to say do it for yourself, but you're also doing it for everybody else. I go back to the herd immunity. The more people that we can get to do this, it's going to cut down on the variance. It could 
potentially could wipe it out. I mean, who knows? But more people need to do it. Even if you've gone in for vaccines and you've had allergic reactions, you can still get it. Pregnant women can discuss with their doctor, but th they can still get it. I think that's a good thing. So um, you're, you're doing that, your community, everyone, uh, um, a service by getting the vaccine. I would just like to say don't believe everything that you see off the bat. Like, I know that there's lots of things spreading on Facebook or on the news or on Instagram of reasons why you shouldn't get the vaccine or side effects that could happen. But click on that link and see where that's actually coming from and do your own research. Don't just believe in what you're hearing from other people because it's not all true. And if you do your own research, then you can be sure that you're getting it for the right reasons and you know the true facts. And if you don't know if, or if you're worried or you're confused, ask. Like, stop me when I'm walking down the hallway and I will talk to you for 30 minutes about the vaccine or come to any of these people and they'll also be really glad to discuss that with you. Um, because it really is, there's lots of research and there's lots of reasons why you should get it. So if there's one reason why you're not, talk through it or research it yourself and really have that reason and know why so that you're informed. Well, um, I guess a, a, a couple things. One, um, we are we're making history. You know, I mean, we, we'll be able to look back on this in in ten years, fifteen years, and say, "Wow, you know, look what you know we made it through, and we all did our part." And in in that part right now is getting a vaccine, helping us to get back to normal, helping us to protect our community, um, helping us to protect others. And I think, I think while right now there's a lot going on and, and there's a lot of information coming at us at one time and we get confused, we don't always know what to do. But, um, you know, I, I, think, I think in the future we'll be able to look back with clarity and, and if we made that decision to get the vaccine, you know, what a great moment that will be because you knew at that moment you were able to help help make a difference in the community. And you know, the other part is, is just, um, we've been working with Lenore Ryan University since the very beginning. I remember back in February when COVID was just, we were just starting to hear about it and we pulled together community leaders and, um, and Dr. Witt um, was a part of that discussion um, and you know, just the leadership that Lenore Ryan has shown throughout this whole pandemic. Um, I just really want y'all to recognize that as students and be proud of that because Lenore Ryan has really shown a lot of leadership and how they've led through and led you all as students through this pandemic and keeping you safe and, and having a safe environment, a safe campus environment, um, making really hard decisions that ultimately I think have, has led to um, a really healthy campus and, and beyond. So um, I think you can all be proud to say that you're Lenore Ryan Bears. I agree. I think LR has been a leader in all of this. Um, Catawba County Public Health has been right there beside them and they have been a lifeline um, to LR and to, as to everybody in the community. Um, I feel like to answer your question, Jenny, I think um, kind of exactly what everybody else has said, um, I would reckon, I would just advise people to look at your own, look at yourself, look at your own situation and educate yourself. Don't let, don't let fear, uh, don't let your friend saying this, saying this or that friend saying that, don't let that be your decision maker. Let, let the facts and let what you know and let that be what makes your decision. Well, I would like to just personally say thank you to each of you for being here tonight, um, for all that you do for our community, both here at Lenore Rhine, as well as Catawba County and the Hickory area, um, and even beyond that. Um, we are all very, very grateful to have had each of you here this evening. And um, we just hope that everyone who uh, signed on and was here tonight, um, that you're all healthy and well. And we have one question from the audience. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oops. 
So the question was, um, just we wanted to just make sure everybody can hear, what are the perceptions of the students and what can the task force and LR do um, to help um, our students? I think that there's a large level of misinformation among students um, who just aren't educated as to what an mRNA vaccine is. How does that impact the body? What's the difference between mRNA and DNA? Like they're completely different things, but some students might not understand that or understand how the vaccines work or what they're doing um, to our bodies once we get them. So I think educating by like having this panel and having uh, our table that we're gonna have in front of Cromer tomorrow and Friday um, and just talking and having those conversations with students to educate them. Um, and then I'm hopeful that we can partner with you to have a, like an event or a way that students can easily get the vaccine um, and be encouraged because like all of our peers are gonna get it and getting the vaccine is the way that we're gonna be able to have a normal semester next year um, in the fall. So, but educating, I think, and then hopefully we can have a big push towards the end of this semester before next semester to get all the students vaccinated for sure. Any additional questions from the audience? Okay, like Olivia just, oh, yes, sir, come on. All right, so we actually had a couple of people in the chat ask some questions. Right. Uh, the first one was that they were told the uh, Moderna and Pfizer was tested using stem cells, but that the uh, Johnson & Johnson actually has stem cells in the vaccine. Is that a true fact? So Probably. I know that there are two different mechanisms of action, like we said before. So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are both mRNA vaccines whereas the Johnson & Johnson operates with a vector. So I think that the confusion by being tested on stem cells versus giving stem cells to the body is because of that, because putting a vector into the body is different than having the mRNA go into the body. And then our immune system responds in a different way based on that for the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But it's not attacking stem cells or having stem cells put into the body as far as I'm aware. Um, but just different ways that they're getting the antibodies to be processed. All right, and then we had one more. Um, and I'm assuming that when they ask this, they mean after you get your first and second dosage, depending on which um, vaccine you get. But how often will the vaccines have to be administered? Will it be an annual thing like a flu shot or will it be possibly more often or less often? And I don't know if we know that yet. So. I know that for the Pfizer um, vaccine and the Moderna, and I believe the Johnson & Johnson, you reach your full um, immunity level that you'll get after two weeks after receiving the second dose. And then as far as I'm aware, we currently know that for 90 days after receiving that full immunity from the vaccine um, is when we know the antibodies are good until at this point, but that's just because those clinical trials are still ongoing, so we'll get more information as time progresses? Yeah, absolutely. I think as time goes on, we'll know that. We'll know if it's gonna be an annual vaccine or, or, or what it's gonna look like, but we're just not certain yet. But what Olivia said was, was right on the money. Well, uh, they are working on a booster vaccine, and in the booster, it's gonna probably have some coverage for the variants that we're seeing, the Brazil, the um, United Kingdom variants. But um, that's all I know. And back to the first question, um, we just wanna make sure to clarify that I know there's been some conversation and some confusion around like fetus, aborted fetuses and the usage of that with regard to testing and um, that that is not accurate is the understanding. And that um, we've actually are in conversation with um, our campus pastor to talk more about that from the faith perspective because I know there's a lot of people who have concerns in regard to that. So be on the lookout for more information in regard to that um, and decision making. So I actually have a question um, about the uh, about the booster that you were talking about. So since they're developing a booster for the different strains that um, that have been coming around between uh, South America, the UK, and I think there might be a new strain in Asia, I don't remember pro uh, specifically, but um, will that operate more like when you were a kid and you have to eat your first tetanus shot and then you get boosters every so often and other similar vaccines? I don't think we really know the answer to that. 
just yet, unfortunately. Those were great questions, um, and we really appreciate that. And we are recording this video tonight, um, so if there are more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out um, to my office over in the Cornerstone House, and we can disseminate those questions to our panelists to get responses back. Um, all you have to do is email at jenny, J-E-N-N-Y dot smith at lr dot edu, and we'll be happy to answer any additional questions um, because after you view this tonight or may review it in the future, you may have more questions that come up for you. And we wanna make sure uh, that we're available and answering any questions as they arise. Um, myself and Olivia will also be out on Shaw Plaza tomorrow and Friday of this week from 11 until one. Um, for those of you that want more information about the vaccine, if you're interested in getting the vaccine, um, we've got pins uh, to pass out to those students. Um, that are interested in doing so about protecting our vent, our den and getting vaccinated um, and we'll have balloons for you to pop um, and make it a fun activity to talk about why it is that you want to get the shot um, so thank you all for being here and participating in our panel tonight we really appreciate all of our guests as well as those of you that were out watching thank you